The day the gatekeeper re-entered my life, I wasn't exactly in my best attire. It was the morning of January 11, 2017. I was 54 years old. From my hospital bed, the view across the Brooklyn rooftops was gray and cloudy with occasional streaks of sunshine. It had been a long night following a frightful day. My husband, Max, sat to my left, leaning onto the bed, holding my hand, his eyes tired, curious, and concerned. A brief knock on the door, and Dr. Stravinsky entered, introduced herself, and reviewing my chart, crossed the room, stood with her back in the window, and addressed us both. You had quite a day yesterday. I'm sorry it was so fraught. How lucky for you that your husband was home when it happened. This is your first seizure, right? That's correct. We found nothing abnormal on the CT scan or MRI. We just got the EEG results, and it is showing an anomaly in the left temporal lobe. From your husband's description of finding you collapsed yesterday and these results, you've experienced what we call syncope, seizure. Suddenly, there was a flurry of activity on the rooftop outside the window. I turned to see the hawk land on the adjacent rooftop, his broad wings arched and protective. He pinned his prey to the roof with his talons, pitched back his aqua beak, and landed it straight into the creature's chest. A streak of blood sprayed the raptor's spotted breast as he tore at his fresh kill. Stravinsky didn't notice the frenzy outside or the plume of gray and white New York City pigeon feathers that blew upward. I understand you're fully through menopause, she asked. I moved my eyes from the hawk to her. Yes, I said. And there's no history of seizures that you know of? No, none that I know of, but I'll ask my parents. She directed her next question at Mac. My eyes dashed to the window. The whole five-minute scene was over. The hawk puffed up his chest, drew up on his powerful legs, lifted his feathers, caught the air, and flew off. Wow. What does that mean, I asked, said aloud, meaning the hawk. It means, Stravinsky said, looking up from my chart, that we plan to release you today. We'll start you on an anti-seizure medication and give you something to help with that bruise on your face. You should see a neurologist as soon as you can. I have one to recommend at Mount Sinai. She specializes in women's late onset epilepsy. The doctor wished us well and left. I turned to my husband, my eyes wide, a lump in my throat. Epilepsy, said Mac, sympathetically. Yeah, said I, but did you see the hawk? The day before, just after breakfast, my husband found me in the bathroom of our Brooklyn apartment in the middle of a grand mal seizure. In the span of about 12 minutes, he experienced a lifetime of PTSD. I have no memory of it. When he first reached the bathroom door, he couldn't open it. Through the gap, he saw me lying face down and pinned into the corner behind the door, convulsing. Breaking the door down meant crushing me. Shouting my name, he willed his tall body through the narrow opening, climbed over the sink, pulled me onto my knees, got in front of me, and felt my pulse. It was steady, but my breathing was highly irregular. My pupils dilated and eyes rolled up in my head. He carried me to our bed and called 911. Slowly, I came to, my mood light as I emerged from what seemed to him the throes of an ecstatic struggle, saying, ooh, and wow, wow. I looked around fascinated, wanted to know how I got to the bed, and when I saw his anxious face, what on earth was wrong? I was cyanotic when EMS arrived. Immediate oxygen and a calm ride to Methodist Hospital. No ambulance lights flashing, no racing through the late morning traffic. A comfort. And so began my journey into the latest mystery of life, left temporal lobe epilepsy, my newest flow state, or flow gate, as I call it. The dent in the bathroom radiator proved that I hit my face on it as I fell, the bruise blue and yellow along the entire right side. I queried my worried parents in Maryland and their sisters in Germany. No one knew of any epilepsy or seizures in the family. A week later, I met the woman who would see me through the first year and a half of my journey. She interviewed me at length at our first meeting, ordered a 24-hour EEG that I wore at home, and which later confirmed spikes in the delta waves of 
the left temporal lobe during stage three and REM sleep. She asked me about auras. I never experienced any classic auras common to seizures, but I described the sensations that I'd been having, energetic lifts beginning around 2013 when I was 50 and still menstrual, and which I began to call my risings. They typically came on in the morning as a tingly or prickly sensation rising up from my belly to the top of my head. They resembled the warm flowing rise I'd experienced with psychedelics. She noted these as simple partial seizures because of the deja vu feeling I described. My rising would come on and I'd sit or lie down. It lasted from a few seconds to five or seven minutes, very weird. Mac would check on me when I hadn't spoken in a while and find me staring off into space. I was there, I had returned, rather sparkly, he said. Gradually, I stopped fearing them and actually looked forward to them. The feeling was pleasant, even blissful. Not orgasmic, but in that direction, a similar full body sensation. I thought it was all the change, and so I opened into them, told myself I was swooning, floating, flowing somehow like a butterfly on the edge of consciousness, to quote Norman Lebrecht. Any hot flashes, fuzzy moods, or temporal oddities, I just chalked them up to menopause. With the risings, I began to experience a channel opening up shortly before, immediately afterwards, or within a few days of an episode. I've always loved writing and as a singer playing with lyrics and translations, now things were coming through with greater ease, potent and creative. I would feel the rising coming on and say, off I go to download, and proceeded to channel all kinds of stuff, poetry, prose, philosophy. A whole worldview came in around the nature of fear and the cosmic impossibility of balance. I just had to get to the blank open page and words seemed to just fall out of my pen. Wow, menopause is really cool, I thought. My poetry's getting better. There's a song in this one. The downloads felt personal, like they were for me. I was the one who not only had the antenna to pick up that signal, but who would start showing up prepared. I felt a responsibility to them. A friend of mine in India, where I'd done an artist residency in 2011, when she heard about the, the Grand Mal, said to me, you may have had a Kundalini awakening, Karen. Don't drug that away too much. Her words went right into me. Stay open to the mystery, I told myself. Seizing could be just another way to flow. Singing is the flow gate that I know best. It's been my play, my profession, and my spiritual practice. And I've been doing it my whole life, since the age of six, when it saved my life the first time. I was born Karen Stamnitz, Karen Stamnitz, in Frankfurt in 1963. My dad worked for Lufthansa, and in 1968, the company decided to make him an offer to move his young family from Munich, where he'd been working, to New York. What a year to land in the USA. The city was exciting if you were an adult. Greenwich Village with John and Yoko, Bob Dylan, Jimi Hendrix, Joni Mitchell, Barbara Streisand, folk music, free love, psychedelics, and strikes, protests, violence, riots. I grew up on the south shore of Long Island, away from all that, but the tension was everywhere. There was a lot for a small immigrant self like me to retreat from, and retreat I did into acute shyness. What cured me was music, first grade choir. I came out of my shell, made a few friends, learned English to the Jackson Five, Elton John, The Fifth Dimension, and Bill Withers. You just call on me, brother, when you need a hand. We all need somebody. I first experienced group flow in college choirs at Long Island University where Mac and I met and here in the Opera Theater Department at the U of A where I came to finish my BA in International Studies in 1984. In my 20s and most of my 30s, music was firmly my hobby, my escape, and my joy. Professionally, I always wanted to do something that would serve both my native and adopted countries. 
I thought it would be in diplomacy in, of some kind, but it turned out to be music. I found my vessel in small stage performance art, singing great big songs in small spaces, European cabaret, American jazz. Cabaret as an art form is utterly naked space, calling for courage and authenticity. There is no place to hide. Creating a new reality as an actress, as a singing actress, for me, that's entering a state of ecstasy. Ecstasy. I've come late to psychedelics and to the medicine of plants. Although the psychedelic space was new to me, I recognized the flow state. It resembled performance flow in so many ways. I had my first psychedelic in 2013 at 50. It was a birthday present, MDMA. My heart exploded into pure love for my sitter, for myself, for all of you, for all of us. MDMA for me, an ecstatic experience, the love drug, pure bliss. Three years later, I communed for the first time with the mushrooms. It was 2016, a year before my grand mal. Psilocybin felt like kin, a plant partner, agent, and collaborator that elicited such gentle introspection as it brought me inward to touch something within myself. Mushrooms resemble song space. A cabaret set of mine encompasses a range of emotions through the songs and their mix of mood and rhythm. Mushrooms feel like that to me. Singing flow is like psychedelic flow, is like the gate around the seizure state. I feel the rise, the lift into this big energetic space where I get to hang out for a while. And then the come down after a show can last for days, tingly like the tail of an MDMA roll or a simple partial seizure. Venturing into the mystery using psychedelics for me means pulling something into the earthly realm and grounding it. A channel has been wide open around my psychedelic journey as well with lots of data downloading in the last nine years. Enough data dumps to inscribe a fable, self-publish a poetry collection, rewrite my entire web presence around a new life arts worldview, begin composing music, doing things I'd never have undertaken to do before, all of which were completely aligned and consonant with how far I'd already come. But life came to a stop as my health took center stage. I began reading and exploring what a seizure disorder meant and learned I was in good company. Prince, Elton John, Charlie Chaplin, Lindsey Buckingham, Neil Young, Harriet Tubman, Vincent van Gogh, Socrates, Michelangelo, all experienced seizures or had epilepsy. Charles Dickens, Agatha Christie, and my beloved George Gershwin. Fascinating rhythm, you got me on the go. Fascinating rhythm, I'm all a quiver. What a mess you're making, the neighbors want to know why I'm always shaking, just like a fliver. The more I read about this deeply stigmatized illness, the more I resisted my seizure as anything other than a one-time occurrence. I was worried. At the same time, I felt that I was held in it by something. From deep inside me and from the arrival of the raptor outside my hospital room, I felt I was onto something. On April 4th, 2017, I wrote in my journal, I long for a culture that sees this as a blessing, a healing, not a wounding. What made integrating the seizure difficult was the medication itself, levetiracetam. I had a horrible first few months assimilating Keppra. I felt like I was walking not quite next to myself, sort of out of phase with myself, and I wondered if I would ever again experience secure, confident stagecraft. I experienced a range of negative moods and emotions, sadness, anger, depression, suicidal ideation. On the positive side, clarity, decisiveness, a more flow with attitude, and of course, no seizures. But the idea of being on this drug for the rest of my life or having had just one seizure did not sit well with me. I wanted to heal my body without drugs fully commit to my keto diet, exercise more, reduce stress. I wanted to integrate the illness, not its cure. 
I wanted to get off Capra. And so I concocted an idea. The Risings, they're a part of me, I said to Mac. What if they're controlled? What if I create a setting for the Risings to be what they are? I mean, wherever I wander off to during a simple partial, I know I come back. I come back with inspiration and language, new language. It feels like I bring another dimension into this one. Mac was intrigued. My partner of already 30 years by then knew me and that this line of thinking is how I do things. My neurologist, not so thrilled. I don't recommend you give up Kepra, but I can't force you to be on anything you don't want to be on, so at least we have to taper it, which we did over eight weeks, going from 750 milligrams twice a day to nothing. On New Year's Eve, I was ready to put 2017 behind me forever. The Risings started up again on January 1. That lightheaded feeling, the warm rush in the belly. I would say, I feel a rising, and within three to five seconds I was in. I'd leave this time and space. Within the first week, I had a whole bunch of them, 13 to 14 in a morning. Short, 20-second episodes where I would launch into a string of internally coherent words and extended discursive about hamsters on treadmills or airport doors or papers on the walls or what are these people doing here? Nonsense talk about a pattern I was seeing in visual phenomena. Lying on my back saying, honey, it's beautiful. What's beautiful? The pattern, don't you see it? I only see you. On January 8th, as a rising was coming on, I asked Mac if the room was going white. He said no, but that he also was feeling a tingling in the air. And on the 9th, it stopped. We were on a good track with a perfect sort of plan that we, voyaging together since 1983, only we could hatch. The idea to add the risings to my life, to let myself seize periodically, and so to create another window for flow. The rest of January, I was fine, fully functional. February, completely normal, not a thing. On January 12th, 2018, we were visiting my parents in Maryland. Mom and I got up early, just before we were leaving to have some mother-daughter time. She was in the bathroom, and I was fixing us coffee when I seized. No rigidity or convulsing this time, but an atonic seizure, limp like a rag doll. Bam, the coffee cup crashed onto the tiled kitchen floor and shattered. Bam, Karen Kohler crashed onto the tiled kitchen floor and shattered, broke my right collarbone. In the ER, they gave me Kepra to take that night, and I haven't been off it since. Back in Brooklyn, my physical therapy began, and the fullness of my epilepsy dawned on me because now I'd had two major seizures. Through the weeks of emotional and physical pain as my bo uh, bones slowly healed naturally, of course, I did not opt for a pin or a plate, I again searched for meaning. What am I doing? What's going on? What's trying to get through to me? What am I trying to achieve? And what a stupid, stupid idea it was to get off the medication. Who do I think I am? God? I looked into the etymology of clavicle, clave, the key. In German, Schlüsselbein. There's something here, I feel it. Right now it's a broken bone and bruised ego, but Karen, there's a key here. The hawk became a fixture. The day after my grandma, a hawk flew into a stand of trees behind our apartment and turned in my direction. You're being guarded, said a friend who saw it happen. Then and there, I took the hawk as my spirit guide to remind me to keep a broader vision on the road ahead. I longed to see the hidden meaning and teaching in this journey, and I began seeing hawks all the time. Cooper's hawks and red tails mostly. I attended falconry shows. I learned to fly them. They were constantly circling over our rooftop apartment and appeared sometimes as if on cue. Hawk whisperer, said Mac. I began looking for them, for songs about them. So these are the three gates of my embodied flow that I know intimately, songs, psychedelics, and seizures. The gate of seizures lasts a few minutes. 
the gate of song a few minutes to an hour, the gate of psychedelics a few hours. My consciousness has spent the last nine years hopping between these gates, gate hopping, and experiencing a connection into a larger matrix by becoming a channel of creativity. Time and again, I've accessed a dimension that seems so real, more real than this one. We can train to access flow. Flow is what we artists and trippers and epileptics do, athletes do it, monks do it, surgeons do it, millions do it, you do it, we all do it, let's do it, let's fall in flow. Hungarian-American psychologist Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, he wrote the book on flow. He wrote 40 books on the subject and really popularized the term. He outlined a variety of components of flow, such as intense and focused concentration on the present moment. Oh yeah, in song space, all my thoughts, feelings, and actions are in harmony. I'm listening deeply with my entire being and effortlessly integrating anything that comes my way. Right things happening fuels the flow. Mistakes are absorbed and not seen as mistakes at all. Everything is incorporated. Turn on, tune in, drop out, said Timothy Leary. He was talking about flow. My stage partners are in flow around me, and so there's immediate feedback, another flow component. As I'm taking their inputs and giving back a float in trust and support, the audience is flowing with our groove and their energy feeds it. In flow, there's a sense of personal control over an outcome, another flow component. As I'm taking, sorry, in flow, there's a sense of personal control over an outcome as skill and task are blended. For me, mastery comes from frequently entering flow until I feel I have the potential to succeed every time I'm up here. I know the lay of this land. In 2008, I created an ambitious one-woman off-Broadway show called Little Death, Songs of Coming and Going. 26 songs in two acts with an ensemble, blending all my musical influences, classical, jazz, blues, folk rock, and cabaret. I trusted set and setting, my partners, my audience, and I surrendered. At the end, I emerged from flow exhausted and enlivened. This was my element. This was home. I make music for its own sake. Intrinsic reward is another flow component. Finding a beautiful song, taking it into my body, giving it away, feeling it come back to me human to human. I've made a career of singing beautiful songs about ugly truths. That's basically what I live for. Communing with the mushrooms, mushrooms is something I do for its own sake entirely. And riding out a seizure is its own reward when the seizure is seen as a gift or as something other than a curse. The last time I experienced pinnacle flow and performance prior to my seizure was at the town hall in New York City in 2015. I sang one of my signature ballads, Lily Marlene, in a show commemorating World War II. In preparing the song for this evening, I stumbled upon new lyrics about peace, written by the original composer who was still, amazingly enough, alive during the height of the Gulf War. I translated them into German, from German into English and debuted them that night sparingly with only my guitarist at my side. When the song ended, there was not a sound in the house. I stepped back from the microphone, released my audience into their applause, which came roaring out of the silence like a wave. So peak and optimal was my flow that when I left the stage, I said, if that were to have been my last song ever, I picked a great one. I'd like to add a few of my own components to our understanding of flow. Flow is novelty. For me, true flow is always new. How can I make this experience different? Not necessarily more challenging, but fresh. German architect Ludwig, Ludwig, uh, Ludwig Mies van der Rohe said, Gott ist im Detail. God is in the detail. I can sing the same song with the same accompanist again and again and find my flow because it's never the same day, same venue, same season, same audience. 
Finding flow is, is something that grows as I evolve. Unlike with psychedelics where metabolically I may develop tolerances after many uses, flow potential in music is eternal. There's no healthy or unhealthy dose. Ask any musician about any composition they love to perform. It never gets old. Flow is forgetting, following, filling up, the three Fs of flow. As singer and actor creating new worlds and characters, I can't pretend to be someone else for even just three minutes if I have no me to give up to be them. So I practice getting full of myself in service to the message and song setting, and then emptying myself into this container where there is no need or desire, just a readiness to be sung. Setting an intention for a magic mushroom trip or a role with MDMA is that kind of self-gathering too, getting out of the way and surrendering into the vulnerability, into the truthfulness of the thing. That's flow. I have to have a lot of presence of mind and heart to empty out that way and let the thing be what it wants to be. This is not the monologue that I had planned for tonight, but close. Flow is infectious. Just like psychedelics can give you a contact buzz and someone seizing in your space and seeing white light can cause tingling in you, so someone else's flow on stage can suck you into your own flow. And likewise, someone else's fall from flow can break your own spell. Flow begets flow. The more I flow, the more I want to flow, and the easier it is to find that resonance. To sing is just to want to sing more, to get back and do that scary thing again and again because it feels right and natural and authentic and true. Flow has its own flow. I've discovered flow states within my flow states. Let's call it meta flow. There are layers within the cosmos of flow. Degrees and levels of flow, early flow, mid flow, late flow. With the total creative energy harnessed on stage, for instance, flow acts like a booster. The tune may be winding down, then someone catches a lift and off we go again, just like the booster in an MDMA roll. In all three flow gates, I'm aware of an entity present, a version of me witnessing, perhaps in a nearby dimension, perhaps as Deepak Chopra says, Awareness as a silent witnessing entity. Awareness having, having an experience of itself as sound, shadow, light, and form. There is the unaware me, and there is pure awareness, watching, guiding, steering, almost like a puppet master. Pianist Kenny Werner describes his flow. It's just one instrument playing another instrument which then opens up the whole world of spirit because if I'm an instrument playing the instrument, who is playing? Ego is in service to flow. In the theater, we play with masks, internal and external. The mask is a critical tool to seeing and knowing. Ego is such a mask. For me, ego changes its resonance, an important precursor to flow. My ego surrenders its protective nature and gets out of the way so I can be present in the now. It goes offline, but it doesn't leave or, God forbid, die. No, I couldn't exist up here without it. Ego is happiest playing its vital role as gatekeeper. Ego brings me to this flow gate called performance art or psychedelics or seizures, and there it waits. That's the agreement. I step in and it steps aside like a butler ready to attend when I return. What drew me to this theme of flow are what I've experienced as the shared traits among the gates, the gates of song, psychedelics, and seizures. Here are just a few. Aura and onset trait. In performance art, there's the tingling in the head, the flurry in the tummy, and the waves of warmth known to precede flow, similar to the lift in a psychedelic journey and the auras in the seizures, which I call risings. 
the elasticity of time. This is very interesting because performing itself transforms time. Time is elastic, but I don't entirely lose my sense of it because as a singer, I live, after all, inside the beats of music and language. I can flow and still have a sense of pacing and duration because I feel that I'm at once inside and outside the experience. My whole being is streaming and I arrive at the same place with others who are also flowing. We're alive as one pulse that drives the meter and the heart. In psychedelic flow, time likewise dissolves. It's my sitter who reminds me it's time to eat, drink, and have a boost. In the seizure state afterwards, I remember a sense of fullness of space and time, an out-of-body sensation, and sometimes the intuiting of other dimensions interconnecting with this one. In the current of performing, of rolling with MDMA, and inside the risings of epilepsy, I feel complete freedom to feel and be and do as I am. Being in flow, I feel discharged from anything else. I'm alive in the moment, riding my breath, coursing with emotion. Freedom to me is being dissolved in a great song, alive in the silence between the notes. I have just been where I come from. I am filled with remembering. I have been home, home in the zone. Set and setting is another common trait. In psychedelics, we take care to create the right conditions for journeying. Those who experience seizures take care to regard the aura as a signal and prepare to meet them. Cabaret is, by definition, set and setting. I create the set and setting that I imagine will be right for each song inside my set of songs, each song a universe unto itself. Near-death experience. Each flow gate brims with world-changing potential. My peak flow in these gates of song psychedelics and seizures count as among the most significant events of my life. Rude awakenings, big happenings, brushes with death. Interestingly, in the last seven years, I've had someone die in my arms on the sidewalk, been called to attend the home birth of a stranger, had candid and often funny conversations with my 95-year-old aunt who really wanted to die and couldn't. It's not that I don't fear death anymore, but I definitely have a different relationship with her now. All three flow gates are ancient. From time immemorial, humans have been singing, communing with entheogens and falling down. We've been singing since we discovered we had a voice. We sang before we spoke. We've always used plants as sacraments, and the history of epilepsy is connected with the history of humanity. Hippocrates called epilepsy the great disease, the sacred illness. Democritus said that the brain is the center of the soul. Galen first described the aura, the Greek word for breeze. Like psychedelic seizures have defied our understanding, though, thereby evoking fear, which has then led to stigmatization. In the Dark Ages, doctors believed epilepsy was the re result of demonic possession, and epileptics were treated like witches and warlocks. Not until the 18th and 19th centuries were epileptics treated like patients and not lunatics. Finally, all three float gates share the trait of stigma. Plato suggested punishment for people selling slaves with epilepsy. Hippocrates claimed seizures were a punishment from the gods for bad behavior. Whew. People with epilepsy have been barred from having children and forcibly sterilized. In the West, well into the 20th century, you had to disclose your epilepsy before marriage, and if you didn't, your marriage could be annulled. Psychedelics have, of course, been highly stigmatized and discredited. Stigma in art brings to mind Piss Christ, a photograph by Andres Serrano, who was accused of sacrilege. Art as a sustainable life path is still stigmatized. Myths persist about the suffering, impoverished artist. Novelist Nick Laird knows what's true. 
We artists live with our pain to transform it, and making art is how we do it. It's how we spend our love. But flow gates have also been used in sacred ceremony and shamanic preparation. In some traditional cultures, epilepsy is viewed as a maturation experience, providing the afflicted with unusual talents and skills. Inuit culture teaches that a seizure is a step in becoming who you're destined to be. A sacred test that once completed makes you a shaman. Well, what if the gods are not unhappy? What if a seizure isn't punishment? What if all our illnesses are sacred lenses into remembering who and what we truly are, which is infinite? What's in the way? The default mode network. The DMN, that collection of brain regions that's active when we're thinking about the past or future. The place where I've narrowed myself down. Once in a while, I squeeze myself back into this tighter place to crystallize a flow experience and give it meaning, to separate myself from it so I can see it, so I can merge, so I can know love. Inside time and space, I can play and discover and return at will to the numinous essential vastness. Once in a while, I alter myself. I, consciousness, enter this play space called the DMN. Woe is not me. Flow is me. The artist is a child with one foot in the numinous and one anchored here in the DMN. That's the frictive constant. The artist struggling is not a reason to turn away from play. That's another box built by humans. The artist must struggle. The artist reveres struggle because, because the artist knows that struggle serves flow. And aren't we all artists of life? I believe flow is our natural state of being, intrinsic and deriving from the all. Flow is not the altered state, but the primary, natural, and potentially ordinary state. Flow doesn't take me away, and when flow ends, I'm home. Flow is home. This is the away place. My, my DMN rests as I am wrapped up in flow, wrapped up in this thing I love and have passion and skills for and that I just fall into. I can't escape the DMN except by understanding that when I'm outside it, I am who I truly am. Time and space is play. The DMN is a play space for consciousness. The DMN is the non-ordinary altered state. In 2016, I wrote in my journal, consciousness is onto itself. I, vastness, need self-expression. I, consciousness, am onto myself. And only in becoming a cosmic drop can I know myself. I, supreme consciousness, say, only in singularity is my vastness shown me. I am that which I am not. I seek to know the node. Where is the point of perspective? Am I a human seeking God or a God seeking God? I return to my home state through these three gates, music, medicine, and the mystery of epilepsy. And through each of them, I've been able to draw a cosmic umbilical cord back to source. Song psychedelics and seizures have me defaulting outside the default mode network. Choices and circumstances took me back like a homing pigeon. That was the teaching of the hawk. Those who dream by day are cognizant of many things which escape those who dream only by night, said an artist with epilepsy named Edgar Allan Poe. Seizures. Where are they now? My seizures were an opening. The grand mal was an unblocking that rather violently came onto the scene. The question that lay before me was, here's some pain, Karen. Are you going to take it or make it? Two months ago, on February 12th, I marked myself as four years seizure-free. 
The bliss states, the risings from seizures, they've completely stopped since we began controlling epilepsy with medication. I have, in fact, drugged those away. The same drugs that keep me on my feet and able to stand here before you are also modulating a part of my seizure life that was heaven sent. I wish there was a way to prevent the seizures but preserve the ecstatic nature of the risings. So here's a silver lining, and this is really cool. I was flowing with the research for this presentation when I made a discovery about the nature of my epilepsy that hadn't come up in two ER visits and four years with three highly skilled neurologists. I took down Dostoevsky's The Idiot and reread a passage where Prince Mishkin is describing his experience in his own words. The protagonist with the same disease as his creator who believes epilepsy is a gift and means of reaching salvation. I shouted, yes, there was a feeling of harmony and beauty in the highest degree. Yes, they occurred in the mornings. Yes, there was a premonition of something that would happen or had already happened. Yes, there was a quickening of the life force inside. My doctors never mentioned ecstatic epileptic seizures to me. Five years after my grand mal seizure, I have self-diagnosed this form of seizures while preparing this monologue. In a work of art, of literature, I find references to ecstatic seizures. Who knew? Songs. Where are they now? After the Lily Marlene Pinnacle flow experience, I took a pause from my active solo performing career, my first break in 20 years. I will sing again, and I will sing my own songs. Psychedelics. Where are they now? After my last seizure in 2018, I was sure that this flow gate was permanently off limits to me. MDMA certainly. Psilocybin? Can an epileptic singer cross the Rubicon with magic mushrooms? Can she cross the point of no return and return? In December 2019, two years after the drop seizure that broke my collarbone, I communed again with the mushroom and have done so twice since. So far, so good. Psilocybin is compatible with my left temporal lobe epilepsy. It is possible to continue a relationship with this gentle teacher. I'm not advocating it. I'm simply reporting as a data point. I love psilocybin because it loves something I have. It doesn't mind my epilepsy. I'm grateful to have this flow gate still open to me and keen to learn from this terrestrial messenger. I was, after all, born Stamnitz. I haven't met Paul Stamnitz yet, but according to his wiki page, he's the big mushroom guy, for those of you who may not be familiar. (laughs) He wears a mushroom hat. (laughs) Paul Stamnitz. According to his wiki page, we may have a common ancestor, a musician, a whole family of them, famous for their Mannheim crescendo for all you classical musicians out there. Integration is the key that I found here. To all three of my gates, to any gates, to my and our evolution, Through integration comes connection, and through connection comes growth, conscious evolution through flow. Applying the insights gleaned in performance, psychedelic, and seizure flow to my everyday life is how I've evolved. Integrating flow states becomes its own spiritual practice, just like meditation. The point of meditation is not to just sit for five minutes every day, but elsewhere in the day to have those crystalline moments of acute awareness where, as my husband says, the tiniest of gestures, like the waving of a hand, becomes the deep meaning of our entire existence. That's evolution. As I evolve myself through flow, I evolve my community. 
Creative integration for me means saying my grand mal seizure was the hawk the ancient companion that grabbed hold of me and tore into me, into my life, and everything essential stayed to nourish me, and everything useful, useless was blown away. It means saying my grand mal seizure was also the pigeon. I surrendered to it, and in exchange, it offered sustenance, growth, and a key into the nature of mystery. I come from where the hawks fly, I come from the network of stars and fungal feet. I come from the sound of the first voice singing, the first hand clapping, the first drum beating. And I know that you do too. Thank you.